So, hello everybody. Uh, we are back on our second stage, uh, Slavarna, with Hacker Congress Parallel Polis 2019. Uh, welcome for newcomers and uh, big hello for those who stayed with us after the Max presentation. And right now we are heading to a different topic. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome on stage uh, Peter Lupac. So we have here uh, uh, a representation of Czech uh, academic research, uh, specifically sociology, uh, because uh, Peter obtained doctoral degree in sociology from the Faculty of Art at Charles University, where he is right now also teaching. He also did uh, research or participated in uh, research uh, and programs in Kansas State University and New York University. But what is uh, most important about, about him, he's an external consultant of the Czech strategy for digital lit, uh, literacy. And uh, what will he also talk about today is his book, Beyond the Digital Divide, Contextualize the Information Society. So uh, Petr and his talk, Constructing Parallel Opt-out Infrastructures, a sociological contribution is ready. So. Peter, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. It's, it doesn't. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, can you hear me well? Great. So it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for coming. For me, uh, being here is a big challenge uh, because uh, I'm not specialist in the topics that this Congress is trying to cover. However, uh, what I, as a sociologist, am interested in is uh, the way uh, the society pertains its shape and uh, social reproduction and also uh, what are the ways we can positively change the society. And uh, one of the ways that I was dealing with uh, in my past, I mean in my academic past, was uh, looking at uh, one of the most impactful attempt uh, of trying to create parallel network infrastructure to change the world, uh, which is now known under the umbrella term internet. Uh, also, uh, I have been recently um, focused on the topic of inequalities caused by inequal access uh, to information technologies and uh, somehow, uh, before coming here, I realized that these two topics uh, can be linked together. And uh, we can maybe infer something interesting from it uh, for both your practice or for general understanding of the things that you are thinking about when visiting this, this conference. Um, starting uh, with an article that appeared a month ago about uh, New York and uh, New Jersey lawyers uh, thinking about uh, uh, suing companies that allow only cashless payments because they discriminate against those who don't pay cash. And uh, uh, I was thinking whether these various opt-out technologies that uh, you are discussing here are technologies that should serve only individual purpose for people who are wealthy from rich countries, from higher strata of society who are technologically skilled, or whether uh, you have something broader in aim, I mean changing society, changing the world. And I bet it's the second, the letter, and if it's the first, I'm not interested. So, uh, my presentation has two parts. In the first part, I would introduce you a very interesting branch of sociological thought uh, which is named Science and Technology Studies or, or uh, Sociology of Technology. Um, but this will not be like academic long lecture describing authors and so. I would like to focus on two key aspects uh, or innovations in this field that we can use to understand better how to opt out technologically, very, whether it is possible and uh, what should we be aware of. In the second part, I will try to interconnect this first part 
with my recent research on the so-called digital divide, which is the state of people having different level of participation in society because of unequal access to information technologies. So, uh, normally in society and especially in hacker community, uh, there is a prevalent understanding of a specific relationship between the technical and the social. Uh, and that relationship is a relationship of uh, unilinear, direct impact of technology on, on social. So, um, when I went through some historical texts of hackers from 80s and 90s, and also when I'm reading statements or annotations of some uh, presentations that are here, I can clearly see the idea of trying to solve social problems or to escape social reality or to build parallel infrastructures by purely technological means. This is something that is very common and it's typical for uh, Western thinking and for our broad understanding of how uh, the world functions and how the society functions. And uh, it is embodied in the classical models of linear uh, technological research that we have scientists, they produce truth, then we have engineers, they applicate these truths uh, into uh, technological innovations. Then we have uh, economical markets that uh, diffuse these innovations to uh, populations and then comes the impact. However, the uh, sociology of technology shows completely different picture which is based on analysis of past uh, innovations and how they were developed and how the impact developed uh, during the phases of the innovation development. And there are two key lessons that uh, we could learn that I would like to start with. And the first lesson is that the social and technical are intertwined. We never uh, can have or work with something that is purely technological or purely social or psychological. We, we as persons are functions of things and other people that uh, we are surrounded, that we surround ourselves actively. And uh, the things that we construct are functioning because we embed certain images of their users into their design. So, uh, and users also means uh, society. So. If you, for example, want to pro program a new software or to come with a, with a new uh, material artifact and you uh, construct it with a wrong idea of what people want, how do they see it, what the, do they need, so this will not be accepted and this will not be diffused and it will end in the pitfall of, of history. Uh, the, the second important point is that uh, because of that our technologies are mirroring our societies. Uh, our technologies are not given and they are not the only ones that we could have and there are specific outcome or specific uh, interactions between uh, technical and, and social. I, I'm still very much uh, a general and I will try to show it on the example of internet development, at least clearly in basic uh, outlines. My favorite sentence from uh, one of the best books about the topic is that uh, the technologies that we have and that form infrastructure of our everyday lives might be otherwise. It just depends on who, when, got power uh, and resources uh, to invent certain, certainly designed technologies. For example, we could have so-called ecological technologies. We have now this wave of ecological innovations. This could have been 50 years ago if someone wanted, but there was clearly no interest and no such meaning attributed to innovation then, even if there were these uh, problems that uh, you could still clearly see. So, um, one uh, of the 
more, more famous branches of the sociology of technology is the so-called social construction of technology. And I mentioned it only because it came with an uh, interesting finding that historical textbooks are artificially uh, linearizing uh, the innovations of the past but there are many innovations that are hidden, that were forgotten, and that could also be successful if the things went uh, in another in way. And the, usually, or in, in many cases, this is just a coincidence or, or the case of probability that uh, we are now in the world that, uh, that we are. And uh, backwardly, then, we are reconstructing this uh, linear uh, linear technologies. There is an important question whether the uh, forecasts that went wrong were only really forecasts that were wrong at the time they were set. I, I choose several famous forecasts linked to a computer technology and some of them were uh, right in the moment they were set and uh, their authors couldn't anticipate in, in what direction these technologies will develop. For example, there is a famous quote from 1977 from the CEO and founder of Digital Equipment Corporation that there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in his home. And it is shown how, how false and naive he was that he couldn't see it. But the problem is that at the time, you ha the, the term computer meant more things than nowadays. And one uh, of the meanings of the term was a big framework uh, which was linked to households via, uh, via consoles. And uh, it was anticipated that uh, the appliances in the household will be also linked to these consoles and will be somehow managed from the center. So when he was talking about the computer, he was talking about one current of development that uh, didn't prove to be successful and that was current of having big uh, computational machines in the center and, uh, and, uh, and uh, linked by consoles with households. And uh, the personal computer won this uh, historical moment. So at every stage of innovation development uh, there uh, is usually more groups or more people involved in its development that attribute different meaning to the innovation. And based on their interactions, uh, the meanings win. They are very interesting, for example, um, uh, very interesting examples of bicycle development. When uh, the internet originated, there were f four basic groups, uh, each, uh, each one of which uh, contributed different meanings to the technology. And the group of computer scientists that saw it as a leverage for societal revolution proved to be successful because they were able to translate what they were working on to the language of army officials so they could provide them with resources. And they could also resist uh, some centralizing tendencies from so-called IMP guys, who are guys from electricity industry who, uh, who wanted to have a certain centralized system with, uh, with high feedback. So uh, another branch is action network theory, which works with an idea that uh, for an innovation to be functional, you have to have a stable set of actors which for for the first time comes in mind of innovators and then they try to implement it in reality and uh, if uh, that network how the innovation will be linked to other uh, parts of elements or reality uh, is well defined then the innovation is successful in reality and the classic example is the example of comparison of Thomas Alva Edison, who was very successful in designing, persuading politics and managing uh, uh, quite a big organization of people who were working on his behalf. And then uh, taken into consideration uh, the way the, his innovations could be uh, applied. Uh, 
which was not so strong case with, uh, for example, Nikola Kessler, and it was a very interesting point in their, in their uh, battle. Uh, so, uh, meanwhile, after the Second World, uh, World War, the sociology of technology develops in the 80s and 90s, and after the Second World War, uh, a very interesting shift is happening, and it's a shift in the meaning attributed to a computer technology, because until the Second World War, it was understood solely as a calculator, as something that has to calcul and to compute, but uh, uh, the idea that computer could communicate either uh, with its user or that it could serve as a medium for communication among people, it was completely strange. And it was one of the uh, very influential ideas that one of the main persons uh, from the beginning of computer networking, the Clyder, came with, and it became very influential in computer uh, scientific community. Uh, for that community to be emotionally and uh, professionally involved in the development of computer network, uh, the, the broader meaning of what they were doing and uh, also uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the broader uh, meaning of what they were doing was, was needed. And uh, one of the texts that served as a starting point that was very influential across next uh, at least 30 years was a text computer as a communication device uh, written in 1968. It was four years before first functional presentation of computer networking technology. And in that text, the authors are promising uh, a new technology that uh, is feasible at, and uh, that can cause societal revolution, that it will make people happier, uh, it will uh, be more effective and productive uh, for, for people to communicate. Uh, in that text we can see passages about that uh, there is plenty of opportunities awaiting for, for everyone to work because there is endless frontier of uh, this computer networking technology to, to discover. So, uh, they were expecting fostering cooperation and promote coherence, online interactive communities of interest and disappearance of unemployment in, if everything gets well. Uh, the only problem could be if there is an obstacle in diffusing these technologies towards the, ho uh, the whole population, to all people. Uh, if we would look in detail on construction of uh, computer networking technologies, we could clearly see that this expectation and uh, prevention of centralizing the system one was one of the main motives behind its, uh, behind its, its uh, development. Uh, in, the, in the 70s, uh, the communities of users who were developing the system uh, started to understand uh, the computer networks as a technology of liberation there started to appear uh, uh, a community, a feeling of people who were using this technology. And uh, in, the, in the 80s, uh, then started uh, the concept of cyberspace, of open sea that you could enter and that you could use to, to avoid the society. And at the time, the, the main enemies for, for another uh, development, positive development of the technology uh, was, was defined as, as the state and uh, the corporation among uh, hacker, hacker communities. Also, and in, in this time, uh, the technology that was based on horizontal networking was successful on establishing new communicating uh, uh, communities based on a shared interest uh, that were very supportive and that fulfilled uh, this part of promise that was in this original text and this with, uh, withhold it until the beginning of end of 90s. The problem was that the engineers believed that the positive impact of computer networking uh, can be fulfilled solely by the good design and uh, for them it meant the reduction to 
networking protocols, so they got rid of uh, development of uh, another layers and, uh, and software and so on, and uh, try to diffuse, to speed up the diffusion of this purportedly positive technology via uh, market and uh, via free market. So, and uh, in parallel, uh, in the 80s, there has been happening a huge investment in uh, the development of these technologies from the private hands and from private actors uh, that went to the formation of privatized firewall corporate networks that at the end of 90s consisted, based on estimation, two-thirds of all uh, computer networks traffic. And also, they start to emerge intermediaries to sort, choose, evaluate information, nowadays search engines, and uh, they also started commercializing of access, so that you have several companies or actors that provide access to majority of population and can serve as a control point for, for the internet uh, traffic. In the 90s, these uh, positive changes that were already stabilized in a certain set of relationship between uh, then technology and people that were using that, starting partially to crumble uh, due to huge uh, increase in the population of users because uh, the virtual communities uh, of the time weren't able to socialize the newcomers to netiquette, to their worlds of behavior, how to communicate effectively, and uh, these, uh, these virtual communities in a traditional sense of meaning became limited to very few people. Uh, another, another problem, uh, or we can call it problem from the perspective of the original promise, we can call so, was uh, that there was a huge investment from com commercial sphere uh, since the half of 80s. Uh, which went to uh, um, which went to uh, appropriation of the technology by financial markets, uh, corporations, and multimedia business, and in interaction with users and with other actors involved in development of this technology, they created so complex system that we are facing nowadays. But that is far from away the original promise. I don't want to say that the original promise was feasible, but that there were many, uh, th 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 there was a certain potential in developing this technology that was fulfilled due to uh, their ability to control the development of the system for quite a long time, it was like 15 years, supposedly 10 to 15 years, and, uh, and even longer in certain aspects. And, uh, and, uh, but, but, but what went wrong? Uh, the, the problem was uh, that uh, uh, they believed that when they design technologically, so they do not need to take care of other actors, of other relationships like states, corporations, that uh, definitely started to intervene with, uh, with the technology. So uh, the lesson is uh, quite, quite general. And uh, it can be summed up as uh, taking care of relations uh, towards the innovation that uh, can be defining for its design developments that can intervene with the original design that the authors had in, that in mind. Uh, in my annotation, I had a question whether famous uh, John Perry Barlow's uh, declaration of independence was too early, too late, or just in time. Uh, at the time it was written and published, uh, it, was, it was, according to me and what I told you, too late for that. Because it is not true that the governments and corporations have not engaged in that great and gathering conversation, and it's not true that uh, the cyberspace was the home only of, of the people who did have nothing to do with internet uh, and uh, commerce and uh, corporations and state. So, uh, 
let's uh, go to a uh, second phase of presentation and it's a presentation uh, it's a part dealing with uh, uh, so-called digital divide these are inequalities in internet access and uh, there is uh, among governments and researchers is uh, quite popular uh, the the model which can be visualized like that that in society you have certain inequalities that lead to unequal access to these new technologies this lead again to unequal distribution of benefits from using these technologies and then it perpetuates social inequalities stemming from using the technologies. So we have something like a spiral of inequality uh, linked to uh, internet uh, adoption because people have different level of skills and different quality of equipment and so on. Uh, the question is, uh, and the question was not answered surprisingly for me until recently, whether it is true that it is worthy to spread internet among all the people, whether it is really something that was in the promise that it will make people's life happier. And uh, if that's really true, that people who are outside of this network are disadvantaged. And we asked uh, a question in a representative study here in Czech Republic, and this was done similarly also abroad, uh, that people has to evaluate how internet, or people users of the internet had to evaluate how internet has affected their life based on their experience in last years. And uh, we asked this question for different parts of life, like knowledge around what's going on in Czech Republic, in the world, uh, uh, how it affected local involvement, uh, how it affected family relationships, contact with friends, their finance situation, career, hobbies, and overall satisfaction with life. And in blue colors are positive answers. So this is definitely a affirmation that people see the internet as contributive and positive force in their life, the least so in local involvement and, and financial situation, but very heavily in uh, the way people feel informed. This is very interesting in comparison with current praxis or with current state of uh, having so much disinformation and people believing in complete nonsense or people that are clearly not true, but majority of people uh, think that they are better informed because they have this technology at their disposal. Uh, and uh, still uh, there are uh, more and more concrete stories about people who can be disadvantaged by not being uh, connected and one of the special most remarkable cases are people from poor families among teenagers or among school children who heavily uh, use infrastructure of the internet and all the application as infrastructure for their social life or communication. So when you're not using this infrastructure, it seems that you're left out, disconnected and, and out of social context. You don't know what's going on and you don't have resources, friends and so on. So we also asked non-users whether they felt disadvantaged whether they experience disadvantage because of the fact that they are not using the internet. And the answers were quite surprising from the position of state information policies and researchers who claim that it's quite bad today not to be connected because majority of people saw who were non-users, it was like 20% of population, two thirds of them were seniors and uh, among other traits were, for example, less educated people with lower income. So uh, they declared that, that they see no change and then they didn't feel disadvantaged. So, and how can we combine it together? Because in the current understanding of uh, having infrastructure, like network infrastructure that brings good, it is only logical that people who are not involved in the infrastructure will be disadvantaged. So it's quite difficult to explain it. So I, I try to come up with a new model or new approach that the, I titled 
contextual that can explain it. And as a byproduct of that model, there is an interesting finding about how uh, the parallel new network infrastructure interacts with the old infra network infrastructure to create new dependencies. So, when we are talking about dependency, uh, so um, from the point of view of sociology of technology, you are becoming dependent on technology uh, once you integrate it into your everyday routine, because you will then miss your technology. Like you can always uh, leave it aside or give up using the technology, but only un under certain conditions. And the question is, what are these conditions? Uh, if there are people, there are people who clearly cannot allow themselves to be non-users or weak users, not be skilled because uh, then they uh, would have uh, really serious problems in their uh, work or s everyday life, for example, students or people from occupations from, uh, who uh, really need these technologies for their uh, normal work. And so we asked people uh, how big share, that if, if they could estimate how big share of their social environment, the people they are in contact with are actually uh, using the internet and uh, at the time it was 80% of population so uh, you can translate it to, to percents if you multiply it by 10 and you can clearly see uh, that uh, among the older population and among the uh, less educated population uh, the people are less surrounded by and other people who are using this technology uh, because of that there is not so strong networking effect caused by being dependent on using this technology for communication and for social for social life very similar is when we ask how important is the internet for work for example uh, uh, 10 is I couldn't do my job without using the internet zero is, is uh, my job wouldn't be affected by not using the internet for a longer time. And you could uh, again see that there is higher dependency of people on, on this infrastructure among younger people and people with higher education being in a specific uh, occupational uh, job. So, uh, the, the, the lesson uh, and uh, my attempt to uh, do a synthesis of these contradicting findings is that you can actually explain the level of disadvantage for non-users of a certain network infrastructure uh, by the embeddedness of a given network in uh, technology in a social institution and in everyday life. It is the first factor. Second, second factor is availability of alternative information or communication channels. For example, if uh, you want to uh, contact uh, some officials and the only way to do it is by email, so then you are disadvantaged but not using it. But if sending them a letter uh, is uh, comparably difficult, or if uh, they live in a house next to you, so then it's not so big problem. So uh, the, the third factor is the factor of differences in the cost outcome ratio when compared to internet use, because in certain activities it is clear that it's more efficient to use uh, the technology that was made for that purpose than, uh, than to use its alternatives. But it is not always so because you have, you have also parallel structures and it always depends on the context. So uh, it was like from the perspective of a single user uh, which can then feel to be forced to use these technologies uh, by, uh, by its uh, environment and surrounding. Uh, the, second factor, uh, the second type of factor on the network perspective is something that I call the ratio of communication network size. And uh, uh, a, uh, the, the factor is titled the flip side of Metcalfe's law. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of 
uh, the classic Metcalf's law, which tries to describe uh, the benefit from using network or being member of a network as a square of number of connected users of the system. And the mathematicians Tongea and Wilson in 2011 tried to model the relationship between two networks when they develop next to each other. And they found out that one wants a certain threshold, which is usually somewhere around 50% of population using the network technology. Uh, crosses the threshold, so then uh, those who are not in the network face the increased increased costs that also affect those who are in the network. Uh, the example can be a car transportation network system and, and sidewalk public transport, because uh, uh, the more people use uh, the car transportation, like individual system, the less profitable is to use public transport or to maintain transport, which leads to, uh, to break up of public transport system and uh, the sidewalk, for example, disappear, which is the case from the history of the United States, for example. And they apply this analysis also to the healthcare system in the United States, which is more expensive because treating people who are not ins insured. And, uh, for example, it's an interesting case to apply it to, to Uber and uh, similar taxi driving system or to broadband internet. Then it leads actually to paradox that the more certain network technology becomes an exclusive communication tool or information tool for accessing something, the more of a disadvantage it disposes for non-users and weak users. So when we focus only on creating technology without having in mind something like a point of translation or alternative ways, then we can actually create the situation of disadvantage by pushing people into that system. So that's everything that I wanted to say and thank you for your attention and uh, I hope you could link the things that I was saying and that were mostly quite abstract to something that interests you and that you heard or will hear in this conference. Thank you for your attention. Okay, I would like to thank Peter or Peter uh, for bringing this uh, sociological point of view to the Hacker Congress. And now I think we have a time for a few questions. So, okay, there is a right hand. Hello, thanks for the presentation. Um, uh, the, the point about uh, as the internet usage expanded, uh, the decline of shared ideas and etiquette happened is re really struck me. So I would like to ask, um, do we face something similar with Bitcoin adoption? Uh, the question is, uh, how can we prevent cypherpunk ideas, ideals, and ethos from becoming diluted as Bitcoin ever expands in user base? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is uh, an idea that I was also thinking about because uh, mostly when people are uh, talking about opt-out innovations here at this conference, they are thinking about uh, horizontal decentralized solutions. And in these horizontal decentralized solutions, it's, uh, it's a question how to maintain the design of the whole technological system because uh, the internet was decentralized technology, at least partly, but uh, there were certain organizations that had monopoly, even professional societies, about defining, for example, protocol unification, standardization, and this kind of stuff. And uh, with cryptocurrencies, uh, I, I think there is not something like that. So uh, uh, it, it leads me to a conclusion that we cannot actually prevent them from being corrupted mm. unless uh, we come with an innovation that takes a uh, more broader social context within. So you, you will not stay limited only to the problem of currency. And, and how to generate it and distribute it, but you will also uh, you would have to also in, uh, invent social institutions that take care of uh, holding it in shape, if it's understandable. Yeah, thank you. Uh. So, from my side, thanks for the presentation. Um, you said that you are uh, basically your research is based on the assumption that the internet is only a positive 
Yeah, so like you said, it's like a positive good. And my question is on how far it would impact your results if one could also assume that internet maybe has negative side effects and if this would change your results, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, for me, when I started to do this kind of research, it uh, kind of struck me that uh, there are two different research traditions and one is dealing with the topic of digital divide. And in 100% of texts published about this topic, uh, the researchers and experts, consultants and politicians assume only positive effects. And there is another branch, like uh, a research in uh, addictive behavior or uh, uh, online crime and, uh, and, and all, uh, surveillance, online surveillance, which uh, show the internet in more negative way and these two branches were not connected until recently. And for example, uh, one of the benefits from combining these two was when you applied to effects on sociability, on how, uh, what effect internet has on uh, the way your social life look like. And then you find clear threshold until which the internet has positive effects. And once you exceed this threshold of amount of time devoted to use the technology, so then the effect on your social life becomes to be negative. So this is the, the answer. You can fruitfully apply it. Yeah. OK, we have time for one more question, if there is any. OK, maybe, maybe I will take this opportunity, because what's on my mind all the time, and it may be a very simple question, but I would like to ask also you, the audience, but first I will ask you, Peter. Peter uh, should be internet privilege or a right? What do you think? What's your opinion? Uh, my, my opinion, and it's also the conclusion of my book, is that it should be right, but simultaneously uh, the government should take care of people who do not want to use it for any reason, because it doesn't need to be only that you're old, but it can be also for a specific, uh, I don't know, values or culture. For example, you are more like nature man, and you don't want to use it, for example, and the society shouldn't allow conditions under which you will be disadvantaged, but by not using one infrastructure, like communication infrastructure. So it should also develop for example, in Britain, there, there was an interesting project of uh, providing uh, assistance via phone calls, I mean, in this state bureaucracy, that allowed to bypass the need to use, for example, online form for people who are old or feel not skillful and then cannot use it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and you, but my question to follow up is just that what we see, and you are also mentioned, the situation is that more and more like uh, big players and big private companies are taking advantage of this, yes. of this like distributed network. And the question is, can you imagine that this, this right to the internet would be somehow secured by the institution which are non-governmental? Is it possible that some private entities could like make sure that we have, and if do, they would do it? It's possible that they wouldn't use it just for like the uh, profit purposes. Yeah, I, I think it's too late, and <laughs> no, I, really, I think it's too late because uh, uh, there's so, so many interests and types of organizational behavior is embedded in internet design that you just cannot go back. Okay. And the problem is that, for example, uh, the endeavor to to broaden internet connection. Who, who does that and who did that in the past. These were mostly companies who profit from having a bigger market and they try to structure or, or limit the ways you can access the internet through their websites, for example. Microsoft was very active in 90s in providing, for example, internet access, the same with AOL in, in the United States, and the same is with Facebook uh, and Google uh, attempts to cover the whole globe with the internet signal. So definitely there are some like positive aspects, but it is mixed with a clearly profit that they can see from that. Okay, so I see here a challenge for the blockchain may be techno blockchain based technology or DAO to maybe somehow <laughs> your like uh, final statement that it's too late somehow like uh, uh, to forecome. But the question for you now audience is like, what do you think the internet? right or privilege so please consider for yourself and i would like to ask you like who would vote for privilege that internet should be a privilege 
Okay, and who wrote that it should be right? Okay, hopefully we are right. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for bringing this uh, point of view to the Hacker Congress. Thank you, your audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>